Wir können die Lufttemperatur rekonstruieren, die Zusammensetzung der Luft und auch den Spurengasgehalt der Atmosphäre. Und äh, diese Parameter sind aber eben nicht sichtbar, die können wir nur messen. Und hier haben wir jetzt ein ganz besonderes Eiskernstück. Äh, dieses enthält eine mächtige Vulkanaschenlage. Mhm. Und das ist also ein Ereignis, was man wirklich mit dem bloßen Auge auch sehen kann. Diese vulkanische Asche, die stammt von einer sehr großen, gigantischen Vulkanexplosion und ist dann also über viele tausend Kilometer bis nach Grönland geflogen. So ein Ereignis müsste eigentlich auch, wenn es die Zeit in der Andertaler stattfand, Auswirkungen auf das Leben dieser Menschen gehabt haben. Sicherlich. Äh, insbesondere in der letzten Eiszeit äh, gab es einige von solchen starken Vulkanexplosionen und da wird sich die Atmosphäre verdunkelt haben. Über mehrere Jahre hinweg wird dieses Ereignis zu spüren gewesen sein. The eruption of this unknown volcano 50,000 years ago influenced the climate in Europe for just two years. A number of other temperature changes can be identified, but scientists are still working to decipher the causes. The ice cores tell us that 42,000 years ago, the Rhineland was around five degrees colder than it is today. But nevertheless, it was a garden of Eden for giant herds of grazing mammals. And it was a paradise for human hunters. The next stage in establishing the identity of the Neanderthal man brings Schmitz back to the Rhineland, to the Caesar Institute in Bonn. The virtual data from the computers in Zurich have provided enough information to rebuild the skull as it must have been in real life. And here, it will start to take on solid form. The whole painstaking process will last more than 24 hours. Lasers scan a tank of synthetic resin and harden a thousandth of a millimeter at a time a solid reconstruction of the Neanderthal man's virtual skull. For the first time in 150 years, or in 42,000 years, the structure of the skull is once again complete. Taku! If the original Neanderthal man was a hunter, what was his prey? Did he attack the giant mammals of his day? That would almost certainly have been too dangerous. Most experts believe that mammoths could only be attacked by large groups of hunters. But scientists believe Neanderthals mainly lived in small clans. So what did they eat? For an answer to this question, Ralf Schmitz goes to Leipzig to visit the leading chemist in the field. Mike Richards of the Max Planck Institute. First, samples must be taken from Neanderthals and from the woolly rhinos, giant stags and wolves that lived in their times. This is the tooth of a rhino. Mike Richards will use isotopes from the bones to find out exactly what the Neanderthal diet consisted of. He needs just a few grams. He'll compare data with that of herbivore, carnivore and omnivore animals that lived at the same time as the Neanderthals. Tests on bones from today are no use because the isotopes in bones change over time. And the denser the bone material, the better it protects the information from the past. I'm taking these samples to look at the chemistry of the bones, particularly the stable isotope values. And I do this to look at the diets of Neanderthals and the animals that were found with the Neanderthal. I've looked at 
Neanderthals from Croatia, and others have looked at Neanderthals from France and from Belgium, and what we've all found is that in each case, Neanderthals have isotope values like wolves found at the site, so it looks like to us they are top-level carnivores. They're very successful hunters. The next step in the reconstruction is to add flesh to the bones. They say you are what you eat, and the Neanderthal man's diet would be one of the factors affecting his looks. Ralph leaves the real bones behind to take the resin skull to the Manufaktur studio in Munich. The only definite data they have to work with are muscle and fat layers of an average Central European man of today. But they'll need to use their imagination too, because apart from his nourishment, his experiences and his emotions will have left their mark on his face. For instance, it's almost certain that Neanderthal man played. And they would have been competitive. Most scientists are sure that they spoke. For a long time, scientists believed Neanderthals wore only animal skins. They couldn't have made clothes because no needles with eyes were found in their caves. But a simple spike would be enough to make holes in leather and fur, through which strips of hide and sinews could be threaded. For a long time, Neanderthals were thought to have lived in unhygienic conditions, but there's hardly any sign of tooth decay in Neanderthal remains. They may have known more about personal hygiene than we give them credit for. But ideas about the level of Neanderthal development have been revolutionized by one astonishing discovery. Long before Homo sapiens, our own ancestors, came to Europe, Neanderthal man invented and manufactured an extraordinarily effective glue. The Museum of Prehistory in Halle has its own supply of Ice Age adhesive. This fragment was found in the 1960s as a dig in Königsauer in eastern Germany. But it was years before the researchers realized what they had. This glue is proof of the Neanderthaler's remarkable inventiveness and of a genuine Neanderthal technology. Everyone thought it was just a piece of pitch. No one believed the Neanderthalers could have made an adhesive out of simple birch bark. And there were good reasons. It's very difficult to make, even with modern equipment. Dr. Christian Heinrich Wunderlich has tried. Dass Sie sehr viele verschiedene Reaktionsbedingungen gleichzeitig korrekt einhalten müssen, die richtige Temperatur, den weitgehenden Luftabschluss und der Prozess muss auch sehr schnell vonstatten gehen. Und das sind Dinge, die auch im Reagenzglas ziemlich schwierig sind. Ich habe etliche Anläufe gebraucht, um das halbwegs in den Griff zu bekommen. Jedes Mal wird es auch wieder anders. Kaum vorstellbar eigentlich, wie der Neanderthaler das hinbekommen hat, ohne Bunsenbrenner, ohne Reagenzglas. No scientist has succeeded in making this pitch glue with the materials Neanderthals could have used. But a chance discovery among a Native American tribe in Canada has given a very strong idea how they must have done it. They put tightly rolled strips of birch bark in a hole in the ground. Next, they packed it with earth 
to keep out the air.